Mike Watt, San Pedro, California, and this is for BassPlayersOnly.com. Flow that low. Hi, everyone. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, the place where all the old rockers come to learn how to groove on the bass. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman. We have an amazing, a very, very special guest this week, Mike Watt. I'm sure you know Mike from Iggy and the Stooges, Fire Hose, The Minutemen, a thousand other musical situations. Mike is very cool. He writes books. He writes punk operas. His brand new project is a record called Every When We Go, which was recorded with Mike Baguetta and Jim Keltner. Hello, Mike. How are you? Thank you, John, for having me aboard. Oh, it's so great. We we haven't done an interview in about seven years, so we've got a little bit of catching up to do. But I want to yes, talk I about in person in Hollywood. That's right. I remember it well. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to the new record, enjoying it very much. It's kind of a follow up to the first record you did with this same trio back in 2019, right? That was Wall of Flowers, right? Right. And we got to clear something up. It's Mike Begetta's project. He, well, he didn't put that first one together. Actually, it was the big ego studio man, Chris Schlarp. Right. Chris Schlarp's got a, right, he's got big ego records too to go with big ego studio. <laughs> and he's, I want you to make a record for me, Mike Begetta. Mike Begetta says to him, okay, I'll do it. But can you get Jim Keltner and Mike Watt for me? <laughs> this is what Mike, Mike Begetta told me. And, Lo and behold, that's what happened. So this is the first time I got to meet him, 2019, like you said. It was a one-day session. Jim Keltner knew all about him, but never got to meet him. And then I got to play with him. Got to play with Mike Begetta. He brought prepared material. It was kind of tough. So he let a lot of that go. And then we did improvise it. We got an album out. And uh, here we are three years later. Uh, round two, another one day session, same studio, same man, Chris Schlarb running the session, Jim Keltner on the drums, myself on the bass, Mike Begetta, a lot of improvising, but he did ask me for this one to bring a tune. So I brought it, brought it to him. Yeah. Yank it out. Yank it out. I knew that was yours. I love that tune. Okay, so that's how uh, open-minded bitch Mike Begetta is to have the bass and drummer man uh, part of the band like that. You know, he 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 don't like hierarchies, and and um, even more he don't like because he calls his music post-genre. He don't like this idea of genre. Music is music, and I couldn't be more on board with somebody. I really hate that idea, and I hope it withers away like other forms of bad behavior uh, a lot of things have gotten more loose and open since when i started playing bass to be with my buddy d boone when we were boys and i know people always uh, yeah the good old days but these, there's good new days too and i'm so happy to be part of this project john i like the album i've been listening to it over the last few days and i find it to be kind of laid back you know, compared to some of the other stuff that you're known for yeah well that's probably why you make more than one record you want them to be different <laughs> part of that's playing with different people and it's not like here's the mike watt show of course it's a mike watt show <laughs> but part of the mike watt show is learning how to be a bass player that aids in a bet. So it's all about the tune. What am I going to bring to help this tune along? And I have my ways of doing it, but you know what? I also have ways I don't know about yet, and I have to learn that I can gain from this experience. You know, uh, it's trippy about that. It's not always the most notes with bait parts. It's the notes that aid in a bet. 
because we end up being grout. And especially if they bring some interesting tile, let's set that tile with some interesting grout. So that's the, the mission I'm on. And so, yeah, when I hear Mike Begetta play, I kind of hear a trippy kind of surf thing. Even though he's from like this Nels Klein school of you know, way out guitar, it's interesting that way. And Jim Keltner doing side stick stuff. I, re uh, I remember that tune I brought in and asking Mr. Keltner about a part. He said, Mike, whatever you play makes me feel good. So I thought I was under the right tack for sailing th those seas. It, it wasn't about, I, I don't have a fear about not being Mike Watt. And it's not because uh, a certain kind of thing. Uh, that I have to bring to bend that tune to my way. It's like, how can I grow as a person and help that tune? I really, I really find it out. And man, it it can be tough. It can be tricky. Uh, really hard. Uh, some of this uh, kind of situation, you know. This all of us were playing it the same time new but a lot of times when you're doing the session thing they already got the song recorded you got to hear it you got to figure it out you got to come up the part you got to perform it everybody sweating you standing there yeah i think everybody should do a little bit of it man but just to do that most of your music whoa that would be a tough call for what but even though it was a pants shitter it, it was kind of a healthy there's such a thing type of pants shit what what was it like did 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 somebody just start playing and did, or did, did mike start playing and you guys just chimed in or did you have a talk over or did you run it through or did you just play together not knowing where it was going to go or how it was going to end up well of course yank it out i kind of knew where it was going because well, i that one, obviously, <laughs> you, you that but that that baby was it that was like fourth or fifth <laughs> we had other ones and the first ones were uh, maybe the first one he had some chords he, he ran us through but he didn't really uh, dictate a rhythmic style so I kind of uh, like he sketched out the chords and then Mr. Keltner set up the uh, what are they called ostinatos the little rhythmic yeah. patterns repeating patterns yeah yeah so the, i start going off of those because this is what a bass can do you know we can be real rhythmic with the drummer but then we can add some harmonic things so i, f I start following the chords but i'm also getting in there to me you know i was asked i was <laughs> invited on this talk show that does the dodger games and these guys all about baseball bass player from pedro or something so they had me bored they want to know what bass was about so i was thinking how do i explain to these guys so well, i'm trying to do a dance with the kick drum and i really am i would tell a musician this the same thing but besides somebody uh, who's a novice with music it's, i'm trying to make because that's the closest note to me so i'm trying to get a dance going so it's really important where that kick drum is and then after that like the snare drum. And then it's the way he's going to feed out the beats on his cymbals. You see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be part of an interesting conversation. Because to me, that's what ensemble playing is. And so when you don't know, right, it's an improvised thing, situation, or it's a, just a guy throwing some chords out there, you got to be kind of like half sticking it out there, yanking it out there, and half listening and see what they're bringing. It's sort of like coming to a four-way stop, and you're trying to see if the coast is clear. You, you, you edge up a little bit. You poke it out a little bit, right? But you don't commit. That guy might bring a good thing. You might be able to bounce off. So you don't want to bogart. Are you locking eyes with him? Are you looking at the kick drum? Are you closing your eyes? Wh what are you looking at? I couldn't see the kick drum because he was in a booth, but I could see his face, which was very important. Yeah, I'm looking at him. 
I'm looking at her eyes. What I'm trying not to do is to, to, to look too much at the fr frets, the fretboards, because then I'll get caught in the old patterns. And this was really important to me when I started writing songs without the bass in my hand. Well, I did it like on a bicycle or on the kayak, where I tried to write my head using the uh, uh, rhythms of nature. Because what happens is you end up regurgitating stuff you already know. And sometimes, you know, that's part of your vocabulary and that's going to help you. But you don't want it to guide. You want the, you know, almost like the bass being a dowsing rod. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, trippy way, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to feel. I really do think the drummer's in charge. And I don't think that's a bad place to start from. And and by him getting that going, at least it's something where, something that plants the foot. And then, you know, and if he's open-minded enough, he's going to adapt what you bring. And that's where you get the conversation go, right? The dialogue. Instead of two parallel monologues, you actually get dialogue. You talk to each other. And then the guy who's running the session, somebody like Mike Begetta, who doesn't have it all realized. It's beautiful that way even though he owns all the mid-range and all that stuff, he's, he wants to see what the rhythm section is going to bring. You know? So he's, he's got his patience, too. Those first formative things, the moments of, of bringing a tune in that kind of situation is so interesting. And so, you know, the knowing is in the doing. Well, this, this is a great education for bass players, for musicians, but... Our audience here is mostly bass players. What can you say to somebody who wants to learn the bass? Like for bass players only is an instructional side, a bass instruction side. Yeah. People are coming. I love it. Almost every state in the in the U.S. and I don't know 50, 60 countries, but probably more than that worldwide. And these are not 20 year olds that are career bound and they want to set the world on fire. These are people that are mostly men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they just want to have fun. They just want to play some classic rock riffs or some blues shuffles. They want to get together with their buddies and play. A lot of times, as some of us know, when you get to be 50, 60, 70, things like arthritis, tendinitis, neck pain, back pain, all of those things come into play. So, oh, yeah. I say all that just to provide some context, because those are most of the people. I mean, we do get a fair bit of women also, and we get a handful of younger people too, but that's most of who we're, we're dealing with. So in that context, Mike, what advice can you impart to somebody like that who wants to learn to face? you got to go with where your body's at. For example, late 90s, I had to move to doing gigs with short-scale basses, because my hands were just getting too sore. Now, sitting down, which is what I do for recording, no problem with full scale, but I could not do the. So what, what do you do? Do you pretend you're that more younger man and just, you know, maybe make a situation where you can't play anymore? You hurt your body so bad. You have to listen to your body. And it, you're on this journey where it's kind of a beat down, to be honest. It's, a, you know, you get tore up. But there's ways of dealing with it. Play less notes. Play them softer. Use smaller scales. You, you know, maybe lower action. I, all these kind of things, but you got to listen to your body, I think, for the less younger thing. Now, what you got the advantages over that younger players, you got experiences. Like you were saying, uh, so, you want to play with your friends, right? You got some grooves, you got some riffs, you got some vocabulary you built over the years. You, you know, it's not your first rodeo. Ah, it's a shuffle here. Ah, it's a waltz here. Ah, now you still want to be there for the moment, so you don't want to just, you know, like an organ grinder, right? <laughs> you can start turning the handle and the stick flows, nothing like that. But you do have experiences. That's a great thing. That's a thing a more younger cat will never have. In fact, you know what the old saying is, youth is usually wasted on young. <laughs> so it ain't all bad. 
but the physical part, you are right. You got to be cognizant of that and you got to adapt to it. Got got to work with it. Sometimes I think we get locked in the sleepwalking cruise control things. and We're not thinking about what we're doing. And, you know, one size fits all. I don't know. I got to tell you over the course of my playing many, many different ways I've learned how to play and going back. It would probably be the worst thing I could do because my body could not handle a lot of those ways. Sometimes I've had to play music. You mentioned that band Pharaohs. I tried to do a tour, you know, 17, 18 years after doing that stuff and I couldn't do it. I used to do this. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Okay, so it goes. You can't do it that way. You change. You're down the road. You're in another place. I think I play less notes now than I did in the older days. It's not on purpose. Just is the way where I'm at. But listening to the body, I mean, that stuff is almost mandatory because you can put an end. So I love the way that you're teaching people this while you're also learning, teaching them theory and you know, uh, musical things, harmonic things, rhythmic things, melodic things. But you're also t t teaching them uh, practical things about with their body. You know, because that is an issue, especially in the less younger <laughs> moments. I, I like what you said a few minutes ago. You said something like, don't pretend that yeah. the situation is not what it is. It, it, yeah. Acknowledge it, make peace yeah. with it, and do what yeah. you have to do to accommodate it. I, I love that. Maybe part of it's being a cripple. Like right now, I'm using crutches. Oh, I have to use crutches. That doesn't mean I can't do other things. But I can still, okay, no cartwheels, no skydiving. But <laughs> other things, I can play the hell out of the bass. You know, uh, there's something else that I try to impress upon my students, and it is, is, is to your point, you say you play less notes. I think you say you yeah. play with a lighter touch. You come from yeah. a simple bass line, a super simple bass line, and still make the music groove, give the song what it needs, and make the music Absolutely. feel good. You see all these kids on, on YouTube doing in incredibly impressive things on the bass, but that's yeah. not what people want in a bass player. If you could just lay it down, you know, play the root on the downbeat, lock in with the drummer, play in time, give it a good feel, make the music feel good. But you can do that without a lot of undue stress and wear and tear on the old muscles and bones. You can really make the music feel good. And nobody's going to turn around and say, what's the matter with the bass player? How come he's not playing more notes? No, they, you probably have a much... Much you do have a much greater chance of getting fired if you play too much, or if you, you're noodling around up here when you should be taking care of business down here. Here's a funny thing in the studio with Mr. Keltner. He pointed way up on the neck. Now, when I say way up, that don't mean by the nut, right? It's closer to the bridge, right? The last fret on the high string, right? Okay. He points there. He goes, look at my upper register. He's pointing with his drumstick, right? Then he points his drumstick way down there by the F, F sharp on the E string, by the nut, right? And he goes, cash register. <laughs> there, you want to talk about some sage ways? <laughs> I just read recently from Stanley Clark, you know, anybody can play a bass solo, which is pretty incredible to read. But he says it's hard to write a good bass line. And I think there's a sense of humility there that a man who could, you know, solo till the cows come home for him to say something like that. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. You know, uh, that, that that's some sage stuff, too. That, to me, that's just as vital uh, what Jim, Jim Keltner did pointing at, at my base with that drumstick. What about negative composition? Not where you're going to place notes, but where you're going to play place holes. That's why it's so important to hear how that guy's going to lay out that kick drum. You know what I mean? That's working the holes, working where you're not going to play. Because 
that can be really interesting part for developing a polyrhythmic kind of collaboration with the other cats in the band. How important is the instrument itself, the tools of the trade? You know, if you, right. You know, there are so many, you know, just go to a NAMM show and you'll see like jillions of different kinds of instruments. You, you play, I know you're uh, partial to the uh, reverend guitar. You have, what was it called? The, uh, the Watt Plower bass? Well, I, I, yeah, the reverend guitar people develop the Watt Plower bass. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, they came and saw the connect was Roddy. Uh, Ron Ashton with Stooges was playing uh, Reverend guitars. And then the, their main design man, uh, Joe Naylor, has a cousin here in Pedro, Mike Naylor. <laughs> so those were the two connects, Ronnie and Joe Naylor's cousin. So him and the boss man, uh, Ken Haas, comes to my one of my gigs. This ain't a Stooges gig, but hey, what? You're playing little basses now, and I was working EBO that I'd modified and stuff. And what? Well, let's try to make a bass that you have stuff going with it that you like, like modified right on the design. So okay, they had they took measurements of this EBO and then had me make a list of things I'd like. And the next tour coming through town, either Toledo, Ann Arbor, or Detroit, one of the three. They'd come to every one, beautiful that way, but they'd have a, a base for me, a Watt Plower prototype. And the first ones, now I'd play them for the whole set, you know, and whew, first ones were like not happening, you know, but how could it be, right? How do they know? The no one's in the doing, right? And so, yeah, fuck you very much, play it, and give it back. And they'd come back the next time, you know, what's wrong? So I'd give them a list of things. Here's... Another try, you know, swing for the fence. Oof, no, thank you. By about the seventh one, though, and and for sure, I thought they were going to think that I was just too picky. And, but no, nope, they stuck with me. By the seventh, eighth one, I thought this is something I could play. So I took all the things, mainly gig experiences, and what I needed, what I thought would help me. You know, I don't bring backup backup bases, right? The one base I bring on tour, that's what I'm going to use every night. So there's things I need, you know. I hope that, that it's there for me. And, uh, yeah, that's what I'm playing. You Just mentioned me. Ken Haas and he, he and Penny with uh, Reverend Guitars. They, he, Ken has always spoken very highly. Oh, no, and he's beautiful. You know, when I flew out to help the Porno for Pyro guys at that Daytona Beach gig, he had a, a watt plower waiting for me. I didn't have to... Just play a Fender bass, right? Yeah, they make a great. <laughs> yeah, we had one of those. Yeah, he's beautiful. He's beautiful. A cat that's genuine, that don't have front, that just don't tell you, you know, something that's going to be worn at the on the sh shirt sleeve at the party, you know. So, uh, but but obviously, after enough iterations, they finally got to a point where you're happy to call this the Mike Watt signature bass, right? Watt Plower, yeah, Watt Plower. Yeah, and it'd be something I'd play. Oh, right. I mean, you know, I ask you the same question. Would you want a bass with your name on it and be something you didn't want to play? That's kind of jive, my book. <laughs> yeah. So it was something, yeah. It, and I, and I got to give Ken Haas, Joe Naylor, full credit for working with me like that. Be beautiful cats. Not just trying to use my name. They actually wanted a bass, and it turned out to be, they told me, they're, they're, they're bass's best seller. It's the one they're selling most of base. And I never imagined that. I was just thinking of Watt working his base. I wasn't thinking about the average guy uh, playing base, whoever that is. <laughs> I really relate to base players as people, as individuals. I love the politics of base, John. We look good making the other cats look good. I love those kind of politics. And maybe, in a way, that's what the Reverend Guitar people did. If we let Watt help us design this base, you know, I don't know. The, the, I don't have the mind reading down so good. I, I could just tell you the, uh, the result of their actions was very, very straight up and, and not jive and, and uh, happening. Something I'm, I was really and am very proud to be part of. Very genuine. I know they're happy to have you as well.
Let's right talk a little bit about the future as far as you can see, because as I, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, you're always doing something. You're always working on something now that this record is done. What else have you got going on and or what else would you like to do that you haven't accomplished yet? What can we look forward to seeing and hearing from? I well, guess. yeah, play with more and more interesting people. And one way, way I'm doing that is collaborating via the Internet trading files a lot of that I, before i talk to you on this call I'm, I'm working on some cats from england's uh song and uh when i get done here there's a cat from florida uh, working on his songs and uh people i've never even met or know it's whenever you play you invest in the next time you play it's re really interesting about that and internet you know don't have to be just used for spread and hate and lies we can collaborate do things uh holy grail be when we could do it in real time but still working on people's uh file at a time that that could be very interesting too and, and catch a little slack so there's a lot of that stuff so you don't even know what's coming it's sort of like being a trippy kind of session man but then there's my own ideas with my own songs and own compositions i got another second man album coming another missing man album coming uh, uh bob lee uh, drummer from the Black Gang, which was my first opera, I got a, a project I'm doing with him called the the Restitch Sitch, and uh, really interesting stuff. I think those old ideas of the way things quote should unquote be are really corny, man. Let the freak flag fly, and bass players, and part of that is bass players becoming more and more composers. I don't know about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven strings. Yeah. I really think it's more about how we operate the, even the four string, the three string, the two string, the one string, whatever. You know, the wa I was watching this wash tub stuff, right? With you, you don't fret it; you actually bend the broomstick. <laughs> Man, that was a hustle. Those cats are, are the guys playing jug. Yeah, but the head rush is doing <laughs> whatever it takes. You know, there's something about bass clef. Something about low end, you know. Hey, uh, any plans for a, uh, a, a tour or anything to, to promote the new record with the guys? Well, Mr. Keltner can't tour. But uh, with another drummer, Steve Hodges, there's a project called MSSV with Mike Baguetta. Uh, Mainsteamstopvalve.com. You can go there for more information. And we will tour one year from now there'll be a big united states fall 2023 tour watson should be ship shape mike i could listen to you talk all day i always have such a great time when we get together yeah was, absolutely what was it not seven years this time though seven <laughs> years ago yeah let's definitely not wait another seven years until we yeah because you asked me good stuff you know and i love the fact that you're learning cats base on uh, with your website Thank you so much. That that means a lot to me. Thank you. Well, I feel like I have to give back, too. I've been playing the bass for however many decades. and uh, Can I ask you this, John? Do you do you find yourself learning stuff by teaching stuff? Ain't that a trip? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I would... Yeah, up, I right? there's, there's some kind of, like, technique, some kind of skill, and, and we're all individuals, so you have to modify that to get through that. You learned another way. Now, I'm, I'm working with a student, and I'm trying to get him to do a fingering, and they said, well, what if I yeah. finger it this way? And there have been times where I said, I like your fingering better. Actually, that makes more sense yeah. because of this and that and the other. So, absolutely. I worked in higher education for 26 years at a post-secondary school that I ran in Michigan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you learn a lot. You can learn from everybody, but absolutely, the, the students. Can That's right. If you keep your mind open enough, right? I think that's one of the goals that you try to keep, you know, how everything else changes in your life. Keep that one consistent. <laughs> well, Mike, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Congratulations again on the new record. It's called Every When We Go, and it's being released. It Well, I guess by the time this interview runs, I can say it was released on November 18th, 2022. Yeah.
be sure to pick that up. And it's with Mike Baguetta and Jim Keltner. I can't believe Jim Keltner is 80 years old. Congratulations on the new record and congratulations on everything else that you've done up until now. And we look forward to seeing and hearing lots more from a healthy Mike Watt in the near future. So thanks very Thank you, much. You're watching You're welcome. for BassPlayersOnly.com, where all the old rockers are coming to learn how to groove on the bass. Thanks so much to our very special guest this week, Mike Watt. I'm John Liebman, founder and first baseman of ForBassPlayersOnly.com. We'll see you all next week. In the meantime, let's play bass.